the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning, Westminster. It is wonderful to see all of your faces. It hadn't seemed that strange because we have been worshiping uh, out in the, in the pavilion, but it is, it's good to be back. It's good to be back inside the sanctuary this morning. Uh, I'm not going to make a whole bunch of announcements. I did want to say just to uh, bear with us, uh, you know, based on the declining numbers that were cases that we're seeing and uh, number of folks in our in our congregation we know that have vaccinations and such, uh, we, we we feel comfortable singing outside at the nine o'clock service. The session is asked that uh, for the time being that we uh, not have congregational singing inside the sanctuary. Uh, we monitor that on a week-to-week -week basis, uh, and again, we're very encouraged about how things are proceeding, but just uh, hope you bear with us uh, for a few weeks here. And what we've tried to do is to some tape some places off to keep us uh, uh, socially distanced and uh, as safe as possible uh, inside the sanctuary. We taped it off, I think, in like family units, so hopefully uh, families could sit together, but I know there are people who have dinner together, and if it's someone you feel comfortable with, uh, then uh, that's, uh, that's totally up to you as far as uh, sitting together. We, uh, we're just glad to be back inside, to be honest, and uh, we're going to have some live stuff and have uh, stuff going as the weeks go on, but uh, did want to just say welcome and good morning, and it is, uh, it is a good day. And I think uh, Mary's going to call us to worship probably after she takes a picture. I heard you oh, you're doing it? I'm, I'm going to do some more. There, this is worth celebrating, I think. So you all have your jazz hands, right? Put your jazz hands up in the air. And say cheese, even though I can't see you saying cheese. Good job. <laughs> We're called to worship using the words in our bulletin. The Spirit of God calls us to worship. The glory of God calls us to praise. The wisdom of God summons us to live with goodness and truth. The love of God calls us to service. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us worship God. Please stand as you are able as we confess. <clears throat> how easily we can learn of God's love, but how hard it is to live it. The world distracts us with its easy choices while we know how intentional we must be to love one another. Join me as we confess our failures to love and we open our hearts to God. 
God of mercy and of grace, you know the secrets of our hearts, how blind we are to our own faults, yet harsh in judging others, how much we want and yet give so little. Forgive us as individuals and as a church when we fail to love as you have shown us in the Christ. Help us to bear the good fruit of forgiveness, compassion, and reconciliation in the world around us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. The word which can transform us is not some idle gossip, but good news for us. It fills us with forgiveness, equips us for service, and sends us forth to love others as God loves us. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. seated. Our first scripture reading today is from John's Gospel, chapter 15, verses 9 through 17. Listen for the word of the Lord. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. I have said these things to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because the servant does not know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends because I have made known, made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you. And I appointed you to go and bear fruit, fruit that will last so that the father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. I believe Miss Allie is here for a time with children. So if we have children, you can come, front, come up front on the steps. everyone. Let's sit down. Oh my goodness. Hey guys. <coughs> happy Mother's Day. Can you guys tell everyone Happy Mother's Day? That was so nice. Okay, who's a reader for me? Who can tell me what this says? Home is where your mom is. Home is where your mom is. So this is a cute little sign. I gave this to my mom a long time ago and now it hangs in my kitchen. And I think it's very true. So when we're at home, 
we feel safe and we feel comfortable and we feel loved, right? But moms have a good way of making us feel safe and comfortable and loved no matter where they are. We can be at home, we can be out and about, we don't even have to be together, but our moms can make us feel at home no matter where we are. So, some of us, our moms aren't with us anymore. Sometimes they're in a different place, sometimes they're up in heaven, but our moms can still make us feel at home no matter where we are. They can make us feel safe and loved and comfortable. They can make us feel at home. Now, I also think you could have a sign that says, home is where God is. Home is where God is, because God wants you, even more than moms, God wants you to feel safe and loved and comfortable. God loves you so much. And, and no matter where you are, God's not walking around on the earth, is he? We don't see him out here, but we know he's in our hearts, just like those mamas who are in heaven, and we can feel him in our hearts. God is in our hearts no matter where we go, or what we do, and he wants you to feel at home with him all the time, okay? Let's say a blessing. Dear God, thank you for unconditional love from mothers and from you. Amen. Okay, we're going to walk very carefully all the way outside. I love you so much. Just in case anybody was wondering, I have not converted to the Episcopalian Church uh, just yet. This is my, this is my summer. I'm going to be comfortable post-pandemic. I'm never wearing a tie again. <laughs> Collar. <clears throat> Our second scripture lesson is a little letter we've been following along. First John, just reading a few verses from chapter five. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the parent loves the child. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and obey his commandments. For the love of God is this, that we obey his commandments, and his commandments are not burdensome. For whatever is born of God conquers the world, and this is the victory that conquers the world, our faith. Who is it that conquers the world but the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? Our final scripture lesson, somewhat odd because it's really the conclusion of two chapters of a story. So it's kind of just basically reading, looking at the end of the movie and then figuring out what happened in the movie. But it concludes, and I'll share a little bit of that in just a moment, but it concludes with Peter speaking, a disciple of the Lord in the book of Acts, which uh, details the church getting off the ground and uh, beginning to grow and move. And it said, finally, Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. And while Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard. The believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? This is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> the church has had many times in its history when it has come to some kind of inflection point or crossroads, when it's had to decide what kind of church it's going to be. We found ourselves in the last decades wrestling with some of those. Will the church find itself in support of or in opposition to civil rights, in support of or in opposition to the ordination of gay and lesbian persons? Throughout the book of Acts, we read about many of those inflection points. Is the church going to be a narrow sect of Judaism or is it going to be a more inclusive community? 
Will it define itself by what it believes or by how it lives its life in the world or some combination of both? The church has struggled with boundaries. And boundaries are good. We need boundaries. Our family recently went to the young, animal, the young Williams Animal Shelter and rescued a puppy. I say a puppy, 62-pound puppy. She pretty much adopted us when we got there, so we just took her home. But those first couple of weeks, couple of months, boundaries, no, 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 do not chew my cycling shoes. The church has had boundaries, and unfortunately, some of them have not always been good boundaries, been boundaries of race or gender, beliefs. Some of those boundaries, unfortunately, have been very visible. Sometimes those boundaries about who's in and who's out have been invisible, but they're there nonetheless. Grady mentioned in a staff meeting recently, we thought he was joking when he first started, he said, you know, we need to really be sure we communicate with people. When we tape off the pews in order to keep people distance, you know, your favorite pew might be the one that got taped off. That's always been an invisible boundary. I'm sorry, Uncle Joe has sat in this pew for 150 years, so nobody else can sit there. But in the book of Acts, those boundaries keep expanding. A scholar once described the book of Acts as the church's breathless attempt to keep up with what God's Spirit is doing. And every time they draw a boundary here, nope. How about here? Nope. Okay, we're going to let the eunuchs in. And it keeps going and going. The story today is about two men who both have dreams. One man is Cornelius a Roman military officer, a Gentile, a good man by all accounts, a God-fearer. And then our old beloved disciple, Peter. Cornelius has a dream that he is to send for this man, Peter, and meet him. He doesn't know what it means, but he sends his servants along. Meanwhile, back in Jerusalem, Peter has a dream. Peter, a good, faithful, adherent of Judaism at the time, has a dream, and in his dream, this blanket comes down from heaven, filled with all kinds of animals that, as a faithful adherent, he would be revulsed to eat. And this voice from heaven in the dream says, take, eat. And he says, no, I've never put anything unclean into my body. And the voice again says, what I have made clean, you shall not profane. Hmm. What does that mean? Ehu, in the story, the two men eventually meet. Peter comes to Cornelius' house, and in fact, he says, this is the first time I have stepped foot inside the house of someone who is non-Jewish, who is a Gentile. And the two begin to share their stories and they find a connection. Actually, there's a really good article. I think it's by Sally Cohn, a journalist. Uh, And in the article, she says that the opposite of hate is not love. She said the opposite of hate is connection. That if you can find connection with people, you don't even have to agree to disagree, but if you find some place of connection, that perhaps the world will be a better place. And I think she's right about that. But Peter and Cornelius find this place where they connect. And eventually, Cornelius' whole family is baptized. And when that happens, Peter realizes what the dream meant. That it really wasn't about food. It was about people. He had been putting boundaries around people, been treating people as if they were unclean or less than or maybe three-fifths of that it wasn't about food at all. And then he says, and what I think is one of the most powerful expressions in Scripture, I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but that in any nation, anyone who fears God and does what is right 
is acceptable to God. That is the broadest, most inclusive, I think, verse of Scripture that you could find. And what I find interesting, <clears throat> among the many things I find interesting about this story, is that here's Peter, a disciple of the Lord, been faithful for many years, a leader in the church. He's one of the people people go to to resolve problems and ask questions. He literally walked with Jesus on earth. And he still, with the help of God's Spirit, he still has the ability to look at himself, look at his life, and see room to grow. Maybe see assumptions that he's held for so many years about people that he thinks they're natural, but they're really not. It's really amazing that he still has that kind of self-awareness to look at his faith and open that, be open to that kind of growth. And it's actually often the case in the book of Acts, but in, in Scripture in general, that what we call conversion stories, 90% of the time, it's not horrible people being converted and now being good people. It's mostly good, decent, moral people who go deeper in their faith, who go broader in their understanding of what the faith entails in the world. And for John, in, in the gospel that Mary read, the little letter that I read, he suggests there that we grow as we grow in love. But that's where it is how we spiritually grow is as we grow in love. And in fact, Jesus said, if you obey my commandments, God's love abides in you and you abide in God. Commandments is one of those words that sometimes gets stuck on. It sounds somewhat awkward. I command you to love one another. But I read an expression this week which I thought captured the essence of that with different language. And the author said that really it's about growing into the words of Christ. And I thought that's, that's a neat expression. That's what, as individuals in our faith, as, as a church community, we're challenged to continually grow into the words of Christ, words of compassion, words of mercy, words of hope, words of justice in the world. And as we do, this little letter suggests that we participate in a faith that conquers the world. That's a pretty bold statement, particularly to share to a little group of beleaguered, persecuted Christians as John did. Our faith conquers the world. It doesn't feel like that sometimes, does it? Conquers the world. The last, what, 13, 14 months feels like the world has <laughs> pretty much conquered us. Somebody asked me a couple of weeks ago, I said, Baron, how's life treating you? I said, like it's a windshield and I'm the bug. <laughs> like it's a Louisville slugger and I'm a Wilson baseball. Like, you know, just, uh, I exaggerate. In the scriptures, the world is sometimes described in a twofold way. On the one hand, it, it is this beautiful, wonderful place filled with miracles, if we could but see them. It's imbued, every atom, molecule in the universe is imbued with God's grace and love. On the other hand, sometimes, particularly in John's gospel, the world is described as this place that, well, there's violence and greed and corruption and injustice that often seems to get the better of us. So John reminds this community in this little letter again and again and again, you are embraced by divine love. It's there. When you can't sense it, or f it's there. You are it's, it's like a mother's love. My grandmother's been gone for years, and there are still those times I just feel that love there. John says, you are embraced by this divine love. And because of that, at those times when things seem to be falling apart, maybe they're falling into place. In our personal lives, in our communal lives, in our, sometimes it things like, seems like things are falling apart. Maybe they're, maybe they're falling into place in a new place. But it's never a place where God is not there. 
For John, the only thing that can truly conquer us is death, and God's love has conquered death. So he says, you are embraced by this divine love. And also then challenged to live that love because you are embraced with a divine purpose. We all are. You have a purpose. You're 74 years old, been retired a few years. What's God's purpose for my life? I got the answer. You're a teenager, just starting to think about college. What's God's purpose for my life? A young couple just had your first child, wondering what is God's purpose for my life other than to get a few hours of sleep, hopefully. Answer, it's easy. You ready? I don't feel like this side's ready. Are you ready? Go and bear fruit. That's it. Jesus said, I chose you to go bear good fruit in the world. Now, what that means in your life, you have to still figure that out, of course. But if we take any inspiration or direction from Peter, what it means is to bear good fruit is to live a life of dignity, to treat people with respect to be an advocate for justice in the world, to be part of a religion that clings more to God's love than it does to boundaries which exclude. Bishop Desmond Tutu once compared a religion of virtue and a religion of grace. He said, a religion of virtue says to you, if you do good, God will love you. A religion of grace says you are a beloved child of God. So live that love in the world. Brothers and sisters, let us continue to grow into the words of Christ and see where the Spirit goes. And then try to keep up. Hallelujah and amen. Stand with me as we say together what we believe. We believe in God, whose love is the source of all life and the desire of our lives, whose love was given a human face 
in Jesus of Nazareth, whose love was crucified by the evil that waits to enslave us all, and whose love, defeating even death, is our glorious promise of freedom. Therefore, though we are sometimes fearful and full of doubt, in God we trust. And in the name of Jesus Christ, we commit ourselves in the service of others to seek justice and to live in peace, to care for the earth and to share the commonwealth of God's goodness, to live in the freedom of forgiveness and the power of the spirit of love, and in the company of the faithful, so to be the church for the glory of God. Amen. Please be seated for prayer. Loving God, we come before you in gratitude today. It is such a joy to worship together in this space, surrounded by people we love. We give you thanks for that privilege. We know we can be unlovable and disobedient sometimes. How can it be that you love us in spite of that? We know that we are your children and you love us as a parent does. You ask so little of us in return. Jesus told us to love one another as he loves us. Love one another. It sounds so simple. Why is it so hard to do? We can find a million reasons not to love others. Jesus didn't tell us to love only those who are like us. He told us to love others regardless of their skin color political or religious beliefs, their gender, who they marry, how they dress, or where they are from. We know that you love all your children. Help us to do the same. Forgive us when we struggle with that. You have called us to follow in the way of your risen son and to care for those who are our companions, not only with words of comfort, but with acts of love. Lord Jesus Christ, we ask you to give strength and companionship to people who have no one else to turn to. Be with those in our community who struggle with loneliness, and in the midst of our busy lives, help us to find time to connect with them. We pray for those who have nowhere to call home, those without shelter sleeping on the streets, refugees forced from their homes, victims of violence seeking shelter, we pray that you will protect and provide for them, be a light in the darkness, bringing hope where all seems lost. Loving God, bring your healing touch to all who need it today. When life feels so fragile and the question on our lips is why, stand with us, O oh God. Hold tight to all who mourn. Hear the sighs of breaking hearts. We pray for all who are fearful and anxious, who doubt your love and find themselves in a dark place, who struggle with illness in mind, body, or spirit. May we feel the pain and suffering of others. Guide us to do all that we can to help. As we reflect on the challenges faced by many in our community, help us to recognize the gifts that we have to offer in tackling poverty. Help us to be bold if it means stepping out of our comfort zone. Help us to break down the systems which keep people in poverty and build a world of dignity and respect. Fill our souls with your words of love so that we may discover the strength to serve both you and others in our daily lives. We pray all of this in the name of your loving son who taught us to pray saying, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
wanted to mention that the session is also asked that as we uh, leave today that we might do our color shipping uh, out of the courtyard outside and it's a beautiful day so that seems uh, like not a great ask so uh, and just uh, also want to let people know that uh, today was uh, Ann Gungan's last Sunday with us she was at the 9 o'clock service and uh, I was able at the end of the service to present her with a prayer shawl that our Thank you. 